I was full of fire to make my home city a better place when I joined the police force 20 years ago. My days used to start with me getting up at 6am to go for a run before reporting for duty. Now when my alarm went off, I lay there staring at the ceiling, feeling exhausted and old before my time. I lived alone apart from the cockroaches that scurried across the floor as I dragged myself out of bed. After a quick shower, I found the cleanest shirt that I could and I headed out the door. I reached to my desk at the precinct just in time for the start of my shift at 8am. I would have a black coffee and a burger with me. Some cops react to the pressures of the job by going to the gym and exercising obsessively. Some drink, propping up a bar night after night. My thing was junk food. The last time that I ate anything green, it was a pepper that had accidentally found its way onto my meat feast pizza. If you listen carefully, you could probably hear my arteries screaming. I had given up caring and while I worked through my morning burger, I had started my backlog of paperwork. I had recently dealt with a case where the perp believed they were afflicted by lycanthropy. A neighbor who had hammered on the door to complain that the howling was keeping them awake was savagely bitten. I had just started working on the case file when my phone rang. It was a beat cop on the line. He sounded shook up. There's no code for this, he said. It's off the scale weird. What's your location? I growled, unhappy at having my breakfast interrupted. Twenty minutes later, I was crawling through the rush hour traffic. The siren was wailing and my guts were burning. The pool car that I had signed out had no air conditioning. Looked like it hadn't been cleaned for months and did smell like an ashtray. Welcome to my life. The beat cop had given me an address in an old district of the city. It used to be a thriving center for the garment business. Bespoke suits would be crafted in hats that looked like works of art designed. Now, a lot of the buildings were boarded up and the ones that were not looked like they should be condemned as well. A patrol car was parked up in front of a shabby facade. A faded sign in the window said that it was a tailor shop. Two cops leaned against the side of the cruiser looking bored. I pulled over and put the engine out of its misery. The back of my shirt was soaked with sweat. I peeled myself away from the seat and I climbed out. The heat felt like it was almost solid. I wiped more perspiration from my forehead as one of the cops stopped leaning on the patrol car and came over. He gave me a dirty look and asked, You the detective? No, I sneered. I'm a model and I'm looking for a catwalk. Now where's the scene? He scowled and pointed at the open door of the tailors with his thumb. I headed that way. Inside the place was a riot of materials. Rolls of fabrics in a host of different colors, offcuts, lengths of thread, needles, scissors, and sheets of paper with designs drawn on them. They were scattered across every available surface. As I was taking it in, I heard footsteps behind me. It was the cop. The guy running this place was an up-and-coming star in the clothes business, he told me. It was a retro thing and being based in this dive was part of the image. He's been in all the Sunday supplements, apparently. First, me and my partner knew about him, was when we had seen this real fancy limo parked up outside. We figured it was stolen and then we seen it was getting out. A total A-lister. He was in that movie about the assassin. You know, the one where he was tortured by his past. Ah, heck, what's his name now? Anyway, he was coming here to get a fancy suit made up. And the tailor is the victim, I asked. Yeah, he's through the back. I went to go see the next big thing in the world of fashion. He was slumped in a chair and there was an expression of utter terror on his cold and dead face. I sighed and put my hand over my nose and mouth. The only attention he would be attracting from now on was from the flies that were already starting to circle his ripening remains. I turned back to the cop and asked, is there any CCTV? Yeah, he replied. A camera back through here. Got the whole thing on tape. There was a monitor almost hidden among yet more fabric. I lined the recording up and I pressed play. 
there was no sound, just grainy black and white images. The tailor was sentry seen. He was still alive and working away, cutting through fabric and sketching. He came across as focused and energized, even in the brief glimpses captured by the CCTV. And then the film showed him glancing up and frowning. It looked like he had been interrupted. The camera was positioned over the entrance to the premises and was pointing inwards. So while the tailor was cut on film, reacting to whoever had entered and broken his creative flow, I couldn't see anyone. As the tailor appeared increasingly agitated on screen, I expected any moment that I would see the intruder, but there was no one there according to the footage. But as the tape continued, the tailor started to back away. He was holding his hands up in a defensive position and was saying something, the same thing over and over I thought. He was mouthing the words, No, please, no. All the while he was retreating into his room, where he had been found an hour later by a supplier who had called around with a delivery of cloth. The supplier had phoned 911, and the circus had arrived. First the beat cops, then me, and next the scene of crimes team. The CCTV film was just coming to an end as they trailed in, carrying cameras and tablets. They didn't need me to get in their way, and I had seen enough. I held myself to my feet and headed back out into the fierce heat of the day. The pool car was an oven inside and my backside felt like it was frying as I sat behind the wheel. I cursed, breathed in hot and stale air. This case had strange stamped all over it. I mean the dead guy looked like he had seen a ghost and the footage backed up that theory. But I wasn't buying that. I only truly believed in things that I could put handcuffs on. I shook my head and started the engine. I needed to eat. It helped me think. And there was a diner not too far from the scene that did a belt busting brunch. Their deep fried battered butter was legendary. Later that day I swung by the morgue. The pathologist was skinny as a rake and always a bundle of energy. I knew from previous conversations that he unwound by running ultra marathons and ate only raw and organic food. And go figure. I would just have to climb three flights of stairs because the elevator was out of order, and I was breathless and felt as if I was about to puke. To take my mind off this, I turned my attention to the autopsied sewn up body of the victim on the slab in front of me. There is a second body under a blanket on another slab nearby. Presumably, the next in the autopsy queue. The pathologist, though, was looking at me. Seriously, he said, you need to do some exercise. I can recommend a program of gentle stretching to start you off. I patted my gut, grinned, and replied, I'm more like a car doc. I just need plenty of grease to keep me running smooth. So what did you learn from slicing and dicing the victim from this morning? Everything I needed to, he answered, and in my report I will put the cause of his demise as a heart attack, but off the record I would say that he was scared to death. We've all got to go sometime, I said grimly. I shook his hand. Hey, I'll see you around, I said. The pathologist was already moving on to his next subject, the body on the nearby slab. He removed the sheet, revealing the mottled frame of a middle-aged man. I started to walk away, but as I did, the body sat up. What the? I exclaimed. The pathologist just smiled. Oh, it's nothing, he said. A combination of muscles and gases post-mortem. Happens all the time. I'll just lay this deceased gentleman back down and then make a start on the autopsy. He put his hands on the dead body's shoulders, and it opened its eyes. It began to groan. The pathologist stumbled backwards looking horrified. He had clearly never seen this before and neither had I. I watched in morbid fascination as the corpse slowly slid its legs over the side of the slab and got to its feet. It was still groaning, a guttural lament that made my skin crawl. And then it raised its arms and started to stumble forwards. The pathologist stood frozen to the spot, staring at it in wide-eyed fear. He was right in the path of the reanimated corpse, so 
I grabbed his arm and pulled him after me as I exited the room. I noticed an alarm button on the wall and I pressed it. A siren began to wail and moments later, a security guard sprinted into view with his hand in the holster at his waist. He ground to a halt when he saw the thing emerging from the room. The pathologist yelled at him, It's a zombie. You need to aim for the brain. The security guard visibly gulped then, shaking badly, he drew. As a law enforcement officer, I could have done the same, but I did not. There's something wrong here, I said, and stepped in between the security guard and the stumbling, groaning dead man. I loved binging on a new series about the dead out for a stroll in an apocalyptic wasteland as much as the next person, but I wanted to give a reason, a try. I reached out and put my hand on the thing's neck. Yeah, I thought so. I said and turned to the others. It's got a pulse. Lower your weapon. This dude's no deader than you or me. Looking relieved and very nauseous, the security guard complied with my order. The pathologist went to the groaning man and checked his wrist and then shone a light in his eyes. This man was in a deep catatonic state, he said. The doctor at the ER who pronounced got it wrong. And to think I almost cut this poor man open. He shook his head and added, I'll be sending him back. Hey, you're the expert, I replied. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a date with an extra large stuffed crust with a whole bunch of sides. The pathologist held up his hand and said enthusiastically, If you give me a minute, I'll send you a link to my favorite organic grocer's website. You can taste the soil. I'll give it a miss. I muttered and left the chilled confines of the morgue for the oppressive heat of these city streets. Night had fallen, but that offered no respite. I picked the pizza up and drove back towards the precinct. Sitting in the lot devouring the slices, I thought about the dead man who wasn't dead, and another corpse who wasn't so lucky. His last moments had been filled with terror, and I was still at a loss at how to catch his killer. I used words like lycanthropy in my reports, but in my experience, the cases I worked stemmed from human frailties and flaws. There were a lot of lonely people out there lost in dark places, thinking dark thoughts. And there would be more dead bodies and mysteries to unravel as a result soon enough. In the meantime, I started on the fries. I had not long finished my meal and was trying to summon the strength to go back to my desk in the paperwork when the radio went. It was my captain. He was five years younger than me, a real hot shot, and he did not like me one bit. You enjoying your vacation? He barked on the other end of the line. Because you sure don't seem to be doing any actual police work. I counted to ten before answering. I'm heading back to base now, sir. Yeah, sure you are. Well, don't bother. A new case just came in. It's a freak special. It should be right up your street. I could have told him that my shift was over in an hour. I could have told him to take the case and place it where the sun does not shine. But I pressed transmit and said, I'm on it. After all, what else would I have done? Apart from go home and watch garbage on TV and eat while the cockroaches crawled around. I started the car and pulled back out of the lot. The sidewalks were busy with people heading to bars and restaurants and cinemas or standing around and chatting. They were blissfully ignorant that I was on my way to the scene where a body had been found. I was still five minutes away when the front wheel of the pool car hit a pothole in the road. I heard something crack and it pulled over. And the car wasn't going any further. I called it in to request a tow truck and then locked the pile of junk up and walked away thinking, good riddance. The body that I was looking for was in an alley. A piece of crime tape showed me the way. It was faded and torn in places from being reused so many times. A cop stood at the entrance to the alley. He was presumably meant to be guarding the scene, but all of his attention was on the screen of a mobile. I could hear the ping of a game being played as I approached. Excuse me, officer. I'm looking for a husk. I left him looking guilty, turned on my flashlight, and went to see what new horrors waited for me. 
The body lay on its back, at twelve feet or so into the alley. Its pale, sunken face stared blindly up at me, and I silently vowed to do everything that I could to bring its killer to justice. I knelt over to see the neck more clearly. There were two puncture marks in the flesh. I would leave the pathologist to find and document all the wounds on the body, and the scene of crimes team to record the rest. They were entering the alley. I had a badge and heartburn but no gloves, so I asked them to go through the victim's pockets. One of the white-suited figures rummaged through the jacket and trouser pockets and then handed over a wallet. There was a driver's license. I had an ID. Another of the scene of crime techs started to photograph the neck wounds. Do you think I should buy shares in garlic? He asked through his mask. I'm the last person that you should ask for financial advice. I told him and then laughed. The fact that there might be a vampire stalking this city had not escaped me. In my experience, it was more likely there was someone who believed there were a vampire, with an overwhelming desire to drink the blood of a fellow human being. I had just seen that they were no less dangerous than one of the true undead. I used the cop's radio to call for a squad car to take me to the address shown on the victim's ID. The dispatcher was not impressed. Their voice crackled in my ear. The Sarge is already on the warpath about you abandoning your car. You want to tell them personally that you think the department is running a taxi service. I sighed and tried to think of a single person in the department who liked me. I failed. But feeling sorry for myself would not bring the alley killer to justice. So I ended the call and set off to the nearest subway station. The air at platform level felt like it had all the oxygen drained from it. The carriage, when it arrived, smelled of stale sweat and the other passengers looked disheveled and tired and angry. I blended in well. I resurfaced, thirty minutes later feeling grimier than ever. The victim had lived in a pleasant looking block. I pressed buzzers until someone let me in and then caught the elevator up. The elevator smelled of air freshener and the walls of the hallway I emerged into were painted into a soothing pastel color. There were no stains, no music blaring out from any apartments, and no smells of food being boiled. I thought of where I lived and I shook my head in despair. The victim had lived in the last apartment on the floor. Hoping this wouldn't be one of those occasions where I had to tell somebody their loved one had met a grisly end, I knocked. There was no sound of movement on the other side of the door, but I heard the door behind me opening. I turned to see a lady looking at me through a narrow gap. The chain was on, a sensible move. This was a nice building, but it was surrounded by sleaze. I shouldered my badge and said, Sorry to disturb you, ma'am, but I'm here about your neighbor. Mark, is he okay? I hesitated. The bitter truth might make her clam up. It was cold of me, but I answered. I'm making inquiries, and that's all at this stage. When did you last see your neighbor? She did not look convinced, but said anyway. Oh, okay. Earlier this evening, he was in a good mood and said that he was going out to a bar. He had been down after his wife left him, so I was glad to see him making an effort to socialize. I asked if she knew which bar that he was going to, and she did. I had driven past the place in passing on previous occasions but had never been in. It looked to be a classy joint for the people who still had hope. Well tonight, I would be going up market, in the line of duty of course. I returned to the subway and descended once more into the recesses of the city. It was a circus down there by this time of the night, one where all the clowns were pressure cookies of rage. It was a relief to ascend the broken walkway and step back out onto the street. The bar was across the road from the subway. Light and music spilled out and beautiful people drifted around inside. I trudged towards it, feeling like a feral dog heading towards the salon for pampered pedigrees. The doorman was too busy trying to impress a fake blonde by flexing his muscles to notice me, so I got in without having to show my badge. I headed for the bar, figured that I would start by showing the barman the victim's ID, 
mugshot and asking if he had been in tonight. I rested an elbow on the bar and tried to catch the barman's eye, but he was too busy throwing a cocktail shaker around to notice me. And then I became aware of somebody moving into the space next to me. Her auburn hair hung over her shoulders. Her scarlet dress shimmered in the bright lights. She glanced at me and said, You look out of place. I shrugged and replied, I'm an undercover health freak. Her lips curled into a smile as she said, You're funny. Can I buy you a drink? I shrugged and told her, I don't drink alcohol. She arched a perfectly drawn-on eyebrow and murmured, So, your blood is untainted by alcohol. There's no room among all the globules of fat, I thought, but said nothing. She whispered something in my ear. I did as she had asked, and I followed her outside, away from the lights of the street into a dark and dank alley, where she draped her arms over my neck and said, Look into my eyes. Accept my embrace. And then she smiled, exposing razor-sharp fangs. Whether they were the result of some warped dental treatment or not, I didn't want to give her the chance to bite me with them. I stepped back, showed her my badge, and said, Are you aware that it is an offense to drink the blood of an officer? Strictly speaking, there was no such law, but I was sure that I could find something to charge her with. She laughed and said, You stupid mortal, you cannot resist me or my kin. And I became aware of two figures further down the alley moving our way. As they came closer, I could see their pale skin and their fondness for black clothing, and the fangs revealed by their malicious grins. That explained why the victim had been drained of blood, I realized. He had been attacked by the three bloodsuckers, not just one female with a taste for the red stuff. I continued to back away, fear pulsing through my body. I was about to become an all-you-can-drink buffet if I did not do something extreme. They were not carrying, so I was not going to go down that route. But I did have another police-issued option, one that would deliver a shocking five-second punch. I took out the X-26. I am walking out of this alley, I told them. And one warning only, I will use this if any of you try and stop me. This brought a chorus of mocking laughter. One of the men said, Only a stake through the heart or the light of day can destroy the vampire. And then he buried his fangs and snarled and leapt at me. I unleashed the barbs. Moments later, he was lying on the ground, twitching and dribbling, and his kin were running away. Well, that proved they were all wannabe vampires and not the real deal. I cuffed the perp and read him his rights. Once he was handed over for processing, I would put out an alert on his accomplices. Dawn was reddening the edges of the sky by the time that I was back at my desk. I started to write up the case then, but the next thing I knew I was being prodded in the back and a sergeant was telling me to wake up. I looked at him with blurry eyes. What's a guy got to do to get some sleep around here? I asked. I got no sympathy in return. There's been another suspicious death, the sergeant told me. Another person has been scared to death. I rubbed my face and said, What's the location? I'll grab a cheeseburger on the way. After a lecture on respecting police property, I was soon back on the road with a triple burger fries and onion rings in the passenger seat. I was driving one-handed so I didn't risk spilling my drink in the car. But the morning rush hour was already clogging the roads and having to slam my foot down on the brakes three times. There was soda on the dashboard and a wheel and fries on the floor. I cursed. I had paid for those. I parked up behind a patrol car that was in front of a fancy-looking coffee shop and extricated myself from behind the wheel. The police car was empty in the coffee shop at a closed sign in the window. I tried the door. It wasn't locked, so I went in and wandered through to the back of the shop and outside into a yard where a cop stood guard over a body. I don't think he's going to get away, I said. The corpse was being kept upright by the wall. Its hand was still positioned as if it was smoking a cigarette and I could see a filter in its fingers and ash on the ground. Its face was a picture of terror. 
This cooling slab of flesh had been a man in his thirties once. His brown eyes were wide open and staring into a distance only that they could see. His mouth was parted in a frozen scream. The cop took a sip from the coffee that he was holding. This is the owner, he said. The barista found him like this when he didn't come back from his smoke break. They also said there was no one else in the alley, far as they could see. We took a statement and sent the barista home after getting him to make us a couple of lattes. I gave him a sour look and said, You're all heart. Where's your partner? I'm gone to get donuts to go with the coffee, he answered. I told him that he was a credit to the uniform and left him to it. I had two victims now, both seemingly killed by pure fear and I was utterly clueless. The great detective, I thought bitterly, as I got back into the car. I began to wonder, perhaps I should let the captain evict me from the force and leave me on Civvy Street. And then I slammed my hands against the wheel. The thinking this way was not going to help the dead find justice. I started the car and joined the traffic. It was crawling along slower than ever. I strained my eyes to see if there was a problem ahead and saw the tops of road signs. There was some kind of maintenance working going on. I figured and tried to sit back and not get too wound up. I had moved a couple of dozen feet when I heard shouting, and then I saw a couple of people running along the road in between the cars. Both wore hard hats and overalls and looked seriously shook up. I got out and grabbed one of them by the arm. I'm an officer, I told him. What's wrong? A monster, he said, struggling to get the words out. In the sewer, it tried to attack us. We only just got out. And then he wriggled free of my grasp and hurried away. This was turning out to be the latest in a long line of lousy days, I thought, as I leaned back into the car and called it in. I could hear the disdain in the dispatcher's voice when he responded by saying, It sounds like the best man for the job is already on the scene, but I'll send back up when there's a unit free. Just love being a part of the team, I said under my breath as I set off on foot through the gridlock traffic. I soon reached an open manhole cover in the middle of the road surrounded by bullards. I peered down into it. There was no sign or sound of anything strange, and a part of me was tempted to slide the cover back in place and go for eggs over easy, grits and bacon in a diner that I could see just a few minutes strolled away. But what if there was somebody down there? Something, maybe something monstrous. I sighed, and it couldn't be allowed to roam free. There were rusted metal rungs leading down into the sewer. Reluctantly, I started to climb down into the darkness. A nauseating smell rose up to meet me and I was gagging by the time that I reached the last rung. I clicked my flashlight on. I was standing on a stone walkway that was precariously narrow and a tunnel stretched out in front of me beyond the reach of the flashlight's beam. Still I tight shaped gross hung from the ceiling of the tunnel. I did not even want to begin to think what they might be made of. Below these a dark sludge flowed slowly into the distance. I wasn't sure how deep this wastewater was and really hoped that I would never have to find out. As cautious as I could, I inched forwards. The sound of traffic on the highway above rumbled through the ground into the sewer and I could hear dripping coming from somewhere. But still, there was no sign of anything unusual. Hoping this was a case of a couple of sanitation workers who had breathed in too many toxic fumes and were imagining things. I decided to keep going for another few minutes and then turn back. The tunnel curved ahead. With my back pressed against the cold wet wall I crept on, inching around the corner until something ran across my foot. I yelped and then realized that it was only a rat. I watched it scurry away into the distance. It was nothing but my heart was pounding in my chest and I couldn't stand the stench any longer. It was time to call it a day. I shuffled my feet around so that I could make my way back to the metal rungs that would get me out of here. Only another rat was standing in the walkway in front of me. It was looking up at me. Its nose twitched above long yellow teeth and its eyes were vivid points of red in the glare of the flashlight. Scoot, I said and I kicked it. 
All this achieved was me nearly slipping off the walkway and ending up in the sewage. The rat itself showed no sign of moving. Now, it was a big ugly son of a gun, but I was much bigger and much uglier. Surely it should be frightened of me. I told myself as I worked up the courage to step over it and be on my way. I lifted my leg and saw a second pair of red eyes glinting in the beam of the flashlight, and then another and another. I swore. There were dozens of rats crowded onto the walkway now and more in the wastewater. These were swimming through the gunk with their noses just above the surface. There was no way that I could go back the way that I had come. I swiveled back around, desperately hoping there would be another way up out of the sewer, not too much further along. My heart sank instantly. There were more rats on this side now as well. I was surrounded and not by dozens of rats, but hundreds. My skin began to crawl with disgust. My guts cramped. I felt like I could not breathe. I was trapped by a writhing mass of rats. In front of me, the rats in the wastewater started to go into a frenzy. They clambered over each other, pushing some under the dank liquid and making some of the rats on the east side fall in. I stared, grotesquely fascinated as something emerged from the water at the heart of this chaos. It was a man. His eyes were bloodshot and his teeth yellow. Rats squirmed on his head and across his shoulders and over his arms as he raised them. Foul water dripped from his skin as he opened his mouth and spoke. Behold the Rat King. What the? I managed to mutter. I am the lord of this underground kingdom, and these are my subjects. He stroked one, especially fat, filthy rat which was draped across his shoulder. And then yapped, he leaned down and kissed it on its lips. Bile rose into the back of my mouth. I spat it out and said, Listen, buddy, I don't care who you think you are, but you can't go around scaring city workers. He laughed, and there was no mistake in the insanity that was bubbling inside of him. How dare you? No one questions the Rat King. My creatures destroy this treasonous intruder. He waved his arms at me, and crazy or not, the rats seemed to be obeying him. They scurried towards me. I was dead meat if I did not act. It was time for the extreme. I launched myself into the wastewater at the self-appointed ruler of the rats, slammed into him with all my weight. I did not know what taking him out would do, but I could think of nothing else. I struck him on the nose as hard as I could. There was the loud crack of bone breaking and an explosion of blood. And then he was falling backwards, knocked out by my pile driver. He lay on his back in the wastewater, at the center of a spreading crimson pool. This had all happened in a matter of seconds, and with adrenaline still pulsing through me, I looked around at the rats. As when they had paused and were sniffing and twitching, and then one climbed onto the man's face and bit. This unleashed a tidal wave of rats, teeth bared, and they poured onto the man. I turned away in horror. The king was dead. Long live the feast. I trudged away from the feeding frenzy back to the metal rungs, dragged myself up and emerged back into the sunlight that felt harsher than ever. I stood there dripping and coughing and squinting at the cops leaning onto a patrol car parked up in the middle of the road. Its hazard lights were flashing, making the traffic give us a wide berth. One of the cops grinned. Well, look who it is, the sewer squad. His partner burst out laughing. With zero dignity left, I squelched away. The pool car was where I had left it, but I kept on walking. If I sat in it, the car would need more than a service clean when I returned it. The upholstery would need burning. I took the subway back to my apartment instead. I was the person that everybody leaves a distance around. One very long shower and a change of clothes later, I went back to retrieve the car and returned to the precinct. I was feeling traumatized by my recent experience in the sewer. So bad that I only had the appetite for a bucket of chicken. When my order arrived, I typed up the details for the case file with one hand and picked crunchy portions of a southern fried out with the other. I would be investigated for what had happened in the sewer but was not currently being treated with suspension. My phone rang and I answered with a wary, 
What now? The answer did not help my bleak mood. Forty minutes or so later, I was walking into a mall. The outlets were shabby and sold endless variations on garbage that nobody really needed in their lives, and it was packed with people loaded down with shopping bags. The victim had been found in a sneaker store on the ground level. But there was a cop standing in front of the tape sealing off the entrance. He looked like he was about to fall asleep. I'll lift the tape myself. I don't want to tire you out. Ignoring the filthy look he gave me when I went into the store, I could see a CCTV camera above the sales counter, and I would check it as soon as I could. But first, I had a body to meet. The store manager couldn't have been much more than 21. He had a name badge with his job title below and the second badge saying, Ask me about our bargains. Hey Brad, you got anything that can put a spring in my step? And then I sighed. Oh, poor kid. His skin was waxy and his expression fixed. The terror that had killed him was preserved for all time, or at least until his flesh had rotted away in the grave. I took a step back and looked around the store. There was no one else there apart from me and the victim, the third to have lost their life in this way. I felt lost, utterly mystified. Somebody was responsible for these crimes. Who are you? Why are you doing this? The silence taunted me. I sighed and turned to leave, and as I did, I felt the temperature in the room suddenly drop. Something very strange was happening. I once more scanned the room even though it was clear that there was nobody there. Apart from me and the victim, and a gray mist that was drifting towards me, I didn't know where it had come from. As I stared at it, mesmerized and petrified, a shape started to form inside the mist. It was a face. There were voids where its eyes should have been and a dark mouth opening, and spectral hands forming and reaching out towards me. Sweat ran down the back of my neck and my legs felt like they were about to give way. What are you? I asked. Up until this moment in my career as a detective, I had been able to explain away everything strange that had happened to me. But this, it defied reason. The thing was coming closer, its grotesque form becoming clearer and clearer. I could see the dirt in its cracked fingernails, the rotted stumps of its teeth and a gray tongue flickering. It was trying to speak, I realized, even though my mind was clouded by terror, I could tell. What is it? What are you trying to say? It peered at me with its empty eyes and then its fleshless lips moved once more and it said, Help me. The words were clear. They were an ice cold breeze against my skin. Help me, it said again. I looked at its face, at the shifting, twisting expression before me, and I saw something that I understood. I saw fear. I saw a being that was terrified as I was. Realization cut through me. You didn't mean to kill them. You just wanted somebody to help you. Its voice reached out once more. Help me. I took a deep breath and said, Hey, I get it, but I'm still going to have to bring you in. The precinct had been built over the shell of the old police station and its basement was a warren of empty rooms and dusty and dark corridors. As I walked down them using my flashlight to show the way, I did not look behind me. I could feel the drifting presence was still there. I did not know how it had followed me as I drove back to the precinct, but it had. It was clearly coming willingly, and I believed. It somehow understood that this was the right thing to do. And now as I reached the place that I had been looking for, I could sense that it was waiting just over my shoulder. I took out the ancient set of keys that had been put away in a box in a storeroom and unlocked the door. The disused cell had not been opened in more than half a century and I doubted that anybody else had been down there in years. It was quiet and deserted, a place where the dead could find a kind of peace. I stepped to one side and felt a cold wind pass by me. I looked into the cell and saw a sad smile in an ethereal gray mist. I raised my hand to say goodbye, closed the door and then walked away. I had a case file to write up.